Do you want to be healthier, yet you just don't know what to do? All these shows telling you this and that, but nothing seems to work. Well, listen close. Golden State Media Concepts has got something great for you. The health and wellness podcast dedicated to workout trends, healthy eating habits, diet, and everything about healthy living. Join us in our banters as we help you not just live life to the fullest, but live it to the healthiest. SMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Alex. This week, you guys, I got my blood test results back from when I donated blood last week. Apparently, they will test you for your blood type, as we discussed last week, and also for COVID antibodies right now. So, this week, I did get those results back from last week's blood donation, and I just wanted to share them with you before moving on to what else is going on this week. So, first up, I found out I am O positive. So, I got very excited about that, feeling like I took a BuzzFeed quiz, almost, because I didn't know my blood type before. And so, I decided to start reading about my blood type and a little bit about what that might mean for my health and wellness. In the past, we have discussed blood types at length, and we have also talked about the possibility of dieting via your blood group considerations. So, after some quick googling, I read about COVID-19 and O-positive blood. And there have been some studies and rumors going around the internet in the past few weeks, months at this point. We're in quarantine time, so I'm not exactly sure how long this has been happening. But this article is dated July 17th, and for a while, people have been on the internet saying that there might be some sort of correlation that's significant between your blood type and the severity of the case of COVID-19 that you might get. But Harvard Medical School and some other different researchers, I read a couple of different articles on this this week, have looked at the possibility of there being a tie to your blood type and the severity of the cases of COVID-19. And this recent study looked at over a thousand individuals pulled from a pool of about 7,000 who had recently had COVID-19 to varying degrees. But these were all symptomatic individuals, and they pulled this information from Boston area hospitals like MassGen. So what they found was that there was no statistical independent effect of blood type on either the likelihood of having to be intubated or dying from the COVID-19 infection. So there's no correlation between blood type out of this 1,289 symptomatic individuals who had previously been tested for COVID-19 and had blood groups documented and on file. They looked at these individuals and found there's no difference in the severity of how sick you're likely to get if you get COVID-19 that's based on your blood type in any way. To figure that out, they looked for the differences between the blood type and worsening of the disease, also blood type versus the need for hospitalization, the need for positioning requirements for patients during their intubation, or any inflammatory markers. And in this article by Harvard Medical School, they go in and explain that the reason they're checking for inflammatory markers is that they think that If COVID-19 is really being extra rough on one person's body versus another, then they're wanting to look for the systemic inflammation, and that is more likely to lead to death. 
So if you have more of the inflammation markers than another person, that might mean that you could be more likely to have a severe reaction if you were to come down with COVID-19. But that's not what they found. So across all blood groups, those inflammation markers were very similar in these people who tested positive for COVID-19, and it didn't matter what their blood types were. So they're still looking into this right now, as this article only came out like two weeks ago, and they did find that there is a greater chance of people with blood types B and AB who are RH positive, so B positive or AB positive, testing positive for the virus. So folks who are AB positive or B positive or more likely to test positive for the COVID-19 virus if they go in and get tested, according to the sample of 1,200 people. There was also more evidence that said that symptomatic individuals who have blood type O, regardless of whether that's O positive or O negative, were less likely to test positive. So they're still looking to see if there's something in the blood types that might protect you from getting COVID-19 to begin with, but your specific blood type doesn't really matter if you do get it. There's nothing that can predict your severity of your illness or the likelihood of that based off of your blood type. The researchers said that their most important finding is this and what they most want to express is that ABO blood typing should not be considered to have anything to do with how sick someone might get if they have COVID-19. So they want to stop any of those rumors in their tracks so that we all understand that your blood group can't predict how sick you're going to get. If you would like to read more about that yourself, you can check out the article in the Annals of Hematology. It is the July 2020 edition. The article is called Blood Type and Outcomes in Patients with COVID-19 by Lats et al. Now, on to the second bit of information I was going to inform you all about. I did test negative for COVID-19 antibodies. So, as they point out on the website, that does not mean I'm immune or anything. It's just saying that I have not been infected thus far and had any antibodies stick around at least. Although, we're still not sure exactly how long the antibodies would stick around. I'm just currently testing negative for those. So since today I found out that I am testing negative for coronavirus antibodies and I have O positive blood, I can maybe check out some more information on the internet and see what that means about my personal blood typing, my personal medical wellness, and see what I can maybe predict about it. I also have what appears to be strep throat this week. I've had this enough as a child that I'm fairly certain this is definitely what it is. And um, it's honestly not too bad. It's not too bad. It doesn't hurt that much. It's weirdly hurting more on the outside with my lymph nodes than actually in my throat at this stage. So that's been an interesting experience. But I also wanted to know if maybe my newfound blood type has anything to do with my likelihood to get strep like it does with perhaps testing positive for COVID-19 antibodies. So I looked at this recent study and it checked the saliva of 310 people in regards to their body's ability to agglutinate the streptococcal strains about 33 different streptococcal strains. So getting them to have the antigens for them and clump them up to deal with them. And they found that saliva of people who had blood group O, regardless of it was positive or negative, were more often able to agglutinate most of those streptococcal strains when compared with the saliva of people who had blood group A. 
So that means that if you have type O blood, then you may have a stronger anti-strep reaction in your immune system than people who have blood group A do. Unfortunately, that doesn't really mean much in making me feel better because turns out I should be secreting more anti-strep immunoglobulin than people with another blood group, but still, my body has failed me and I find myself with strep again. They think that there is a blood type antigen in saliva and mucus that comes from O types that helps prevent the growth of streptococcus in the throat. So that is why you might have someone in your life who gets strep all the time and someone else who seemingly still never gets sick even when you are in a household together. That one person who just doesn't really get sick half the time when everyone else is super sick. So maybe there is a blood type reason in that with your family. Meanwhile, today I learned that I may be more likely to test positive for COVID-19 antibodies, but I tested negative for those, and I should be more protected against strep, perhaps, than I actually am. So, turns out this is about as useful as a BuzzFeed quiz in predicting that for me personally. And that's okay because all data is good data, and at the end of the day, like the doctors said in their research article, there is not enough of an association between any of these blood groups to be a real predictive factor anyway. So really, even though I'm not meeting the other components of the data, I am still proving their rule. We're gonna go on a quick break, and when we come back, We're going to talk more about sore throat as that pertains to COVID versus strep throat, etc. We'll be back here in just a minute. Are you looking to learn more about the latest trends from the fitness world? Are you confused by all the different trends that are out there? The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place for you. The GSMC Fitness Podcast is the place to come for people of all skill and interest levels. Join us as we explore the latest trends in the fitness world. Does that new exercise really work? Should I try yoga? Whatever your question, chances are good you'll find an answer on the GSMC Fitness Podcast. results from the blood I had drawn last week to donate. I went ahead and did it knowing that they could just fill out my blood type is essentially TBD. And when I found out they were also going to send me my blood type results in addition to just documenting it for me via this online portal, it was really awesome and I was immediately interested in figuring out what blood type I have. I'm a organ donor on my paperwork for my driver's license and everything, but uh, I did not know my actual blood type before now. So I wanted to follow up with you guys on that, and we were talking in our last segment about the likelihood of getting different types of illnesses or the severities of different illnesses based on your blood type. And now I also want to talk about a question people have recently asked me oh no, you have strep throat, are you sure it isn't corona? What makes you think that it's not corona, are you sure? Well, there are a couple of ways that we can differentiate between these different symptoms. So I wanted to talk to you guys about that today and generally allay a lot of folks' fears and answer these questions. So first up, If you have a sore throat, is that a symptom of coronavirus? Yes, 
According to the CDC, there are various symptoms that vary widely between people with coronavirus, but a sore throat is one of the symptoms that is fairly common. Then we also have things like the common cold, which can also give you a sore throat. You can get this via respiratory issues of other types too, asthma, etc., things that cause severe coughing or just as a result of severe coughing. There are numerous reasons why you could have a sore throat. Right now, a lot of folks immediately think of COVID-19. When they think of someone getting sick immediately, no matter what the type of symptoms tend to be, but especially if they're respiratory in nature. But there was a recent COVID-19 study that was conducted by the World Health Organization, and they found that only 13.9% of 55,000 people who were confirmed cases of coronavirus had actually reported a sore throat. So only... 13-14% of people who have definitely been tested positive of having corona have had a sore throat as one of their symptoms. They also did two additional studies in China and found that a sore throat is a less common symptom with only 5-7% to of people in these studies reporting that as one of their symptoms. So it's possible, but not really as likely as other symptoms. But really, what are some of the other symptoms? So we recognize that, and we can educate ourselves and be more informed and less fearful. Well, first up, the three most common symptoms of COVID-19 are fever, a cough that can be dry or wet, and a general sense of fatigue. Along with these top three signs, and the less commonly reported sore throat are shortness of breath, headaches, body aches, pains and chills, runny or stuffy nose, digestive symptoms, so anything in the GI tract like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or having a loss of taste or smell. Those are a lot of the other symptoms. So mostly coughing, fatigue, and fever. We're still getting more symptoms and more information about that as new data comes in, so that type and frequency of the symptoms could change. That's just how science and data work, is you get in more information and the numbers are going to change. You don't know which direction they're going to change in, but they will definitely have to change. If you do have a sore throat, though, like I have started with, and you're wanting to figure out if you have the flu or COVID or strep or cold or allergies, remember, first off, I am not a doctor, but there is a general flow chart that you can follow for most things in life, i found, and this is one of them. As always, if you personally feel that you might have COVID-19 or any type of illness that needs to be addressed, definitely reach out to your doctor and take their advice over mine. But first up, if you have a sore throat, then you want to ask yourself if you've recently traveled to somewhere that has a widespread outbreak, whether that be overseas or on a plane or on a cruise or even across state lines in the past two weeks or so. And if you did during that time, was there a wide outbreak there? Or even if there wasn't one, did you have close contact with someone who had been confirmed to have COVID-19? If you do feel that way, that you have traveled in one of those places and or had close contact with someone who has been diagnosed, then you may have COVID-19 and you should be speaking to your doctor about that. If you have not checked any of those boxes for recent travel or close contact, then ask yourself whether or not you have a fever. If you do, then you're going to ask yourself if you have shortness of breath. If you don't have shortness of breath, then you very well may have strep throat. So that is headache and vomiting or nausea as the other symptoms generally accompanied by those pustules. Whereas if you are experiencing shortness of breath, that may be COVID-19 or the flu. 
if you do not have a fever, but you have recently had contact with someone with COVID, then it's generally more likely that if you ask yourself, do you have itchy eyes and no fever? And the answer is yes, then you're more likely to have allergies. That's just a general flow chart to go by if you are wanting to work your way through what your personal threshold is and your own familiarity with this novel disease versus the ones we have all grown up with, just so that we may be more familiar. For me, I find comfort in that knowledge and familiarity, so if I can remember this basic flow chart and ask myself about those symptoms, I can generally just feel a little bit more at ease. I feel confident in saying, hey, yeah, I'm pretty sure I'm okay, or I'm pretty sure that I have this issue instead of something that is more serious. After all, we also don't want to be clogging the different emergency rooms and any other medical facilities or even telemedicine lines with the flu if we know this is something we can weather out or with allergies or the cold. Always, of course, call your doctor if you truly suspect it's something very serious. Listen to your gut. But I also like to keep in mind that the lines are super full right now and that a lot of folks are trying to get into the doctor who are perhaps a lot sicker than I am. So having the knowledge in this case to help differentiate between these types of issues and what is severe enough to warrant a trip to the doctor's office, it is going to help prevent a strain on the healthcare system. They're already strained right now. So we're going to keep an eye out for that. It's going to save us money by knowing and also help our general wellness and happiness by helping us feel more confident and optimistic in feeling that we are right about what's going on with our bodies and exactly how worried we should be right now. I especially wanted to talk about this as we start to get closer to the fall. I know it's still July, what am I talking about? But y'all have seen the Halloween memes on Facebook already and this year feels like it has gone by so fast that I feel like Halloween is right around the corner and with it, you know, flu season. So forewarned is forearmed, my friends. So we're going to know these differences in a broader way together. The pustules on my throat are pretty much a dead giveaway for strep, and pustules is such a gross word. But that is what they're called, those little white spots in the back of your throat that are usually the dead giveaway that you have strep throat and not some viral form of pharyngitis. Although, to each their own, not everyone gets the pustules, so it's a lot harder for some people to tell it apart than others. But if you do have them, it can be a helpful criterion for sorting through the likelihoods of what you have. So now that we know that primary difference, what about for COVID-19 versus the cold or flu? It does share many more symptoms with the cold and flu than it does with strep. Those white spots being exclusionary of all three of these help out a lot. So far, as we discussed with COVID-19, the most commonly reported symptoms are fever, cough, and fatigue. The other symptoms that have been reported from the shortness of breath and other symptoms occurred far less frequently. The common cold and the flu are a little bit different in how they come on. You usually get a flu kind of suddenly, but a cold is more gradual. And that's something that the cold shares in common with COVID-19 is its onset. But the most common early symptoms of the flu are sore throat and a runny or stuffy nose. Fevers are pretty rare, really, with a cold, according to a lot of research data. And in that way, if you have a fever, you are more likely to have the flu or COVID-19 than a cold. Although you can technically get the fever with a cold. 
So the TLDR of is it COVID-19 or strep or the common cold or the flu, you're going to ask yourself, do you have a sore throat? If yes, do you have white spots? Yes, then you very well have strep throat. You're not likely to have the other things. Now, if you, on the other hand, are not having a sore throat, but you do have a fever and a cough and fatigue, then you might have COVID-19, especially if that onset developed very gradually since the most common symptoms of the flu are chills and headaches and body aches and pain, which is less common than COVID-19, and it tends to come on suddenly. If you are worried about it in any case, and you want to be sure, they recommend right now that if you think you have COVID-19, stay home, plan to only leave your home to get medical care, if at all possible, and distance yourself from the folks who live in the home with you as much as possible. You can still follow some of those instructions in disinfecting and sanitizing that we have discussed in regards to COVID-19 in a previous episode, if you would like. You can also go ahead and call your doctor. That should be one of your first steps, and they can talk to you about how to take care of yourself while you are dealing with the possibility of having COVID-19, and they may even be able to keep you tested. Make sure that you also keep track of your symptoms if you are able to, and that way you can see if the severity changes or if you have any symptoms that should be warning signs of perhaps anything else. I spoke to a telemedicine individual, a person who scheduled for it today. I've never done telemedicine before, so I wasn't sure how to approach that. And today when I spoke with them on the phone, they also said that right now, A lot of these places are giving folks discounts on their doctor's visits because of COVID-19. The particular place that I called was a 49% discount because there's COVID-19 going on right now and they are trying to reduce that load on patients. So if you have been holding off on visiting a doctor perhaps for monetary reasons and that is something that might help you out, I encourage you to reach out to the local clinics in your area and ask them about that. Remember, if you do have something like strep throat, you do need antibiotics for that, even if it's typically not as serious as COVID-19. COVID-19, the flu, and a cold are all viruses, whereas having strep throat is a bacteria, and that means that you need antibiotics for that in order to help clear up those pustules and make it totally go away and also help prevent you from being contagious. So whether you have strep or COVID-19, you should still probably reach out to a doctor and you can do that now through this really cool advent of technology and modern medicine called telemedicine. We're starting to live in that Star Trek future, you guys. It's still really grim right here. But we are moving forward still in technology. And remember, necessity is the mother of invention. So hopefully amidst all of the chaos and terrible things happening right now, we will also end up making medical treatment more accessible to a lot of folks who, for whatever reason, were not able to leave their homes to get medical treatment. Whether that's a mental health issue or a physical ailment that may be causing that. Across the spectrum, there are people that can benefit from this. And this necessity, as grim as it often is, does have the silver lining of helping other people who need access obtain it in a more affordable and accessible manner. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about another aspect of affordability as it relates to our illness seasons, like flu season slash strep season. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. 
There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. between sicknesses like COVID-19, the flu, cold, and strep throat right now, and how to tell the difference and respond accordingly. Now we're going to talk about ways that we can save a little bit of money in getting this type of diagnosis in the era of coronavirus. So, there is something that's recently come to my attention that I perhaps should have known for a lot longer than this, but alas, I learned it pretty much this past week. So, this information is that technically, a pharmacist can often prescribe antibiotics or other different illnesses. I didn't know that. Which also helps me understand the context of pharmacists giving people flu shots. That is something that has mystified me for a long time. I didn't realize that there are often clinics in pharmacy areas. I thought those were just perks that they were offering to try to convince you to use their particular pharmacy. I mean, it's probably also likely somewhat that. But it turns out that there are a number of things that they can diagnose you with and also offer you a treatment there. And especially if you don't have insurance, that may be a lot cheaper than going to a different doctor's office or going to urgent care or wherever you have been going to get your diagnoses and treatments for these 32 different and minor ailments for which pharmacists in the U.S. are allowed to prescribe antibiotics and other types of medication as needed. You're not always going to get antibiotics is what I'm saying, only if whatever you have is bacterial in origin. But you get my point. So, Today, I wanted to go over that option with you guys and see what all they can do to help make healthcare more accessible and more affordable, and to make health and wellness more accessible and more affordable. So, if you go to certain pharmacies, they have the capability of doing this. I contacted my local Walmart today, and they told me they had been thinking about making that something that they did in the future, but for the time being, they did not have a minute clinic. And that's the brand name as well, I believe, of the similar type of service that they offer at CVS. I believe theirs is specifically called the Minute Clinic. And when I didn't know where to reach out at that time to find out where a minute clinic might be other than Googling, she went ahead and just offered me that information of, hey, you know, if you're in this town, then these places might offer it. This is where you should check. And if not, go here. It was just an overall really positive experience. And so although I'm not thankful that I have (laughs) strep throat right now, I am thankful that I had a really great interaction with a stranger today who is exceptionally nice to me for no gain of her own. She had nothing to gain by being super nice to me, and I'd already been on the phone with a lot of people who are really rude today. So this really brightened my day, and I think also gave me a little pep in my mental and emotional wellness step. It just made my day happier in general. 
So shout out to the lady I talked to on the phone today at the local Walmart pharmacy. Now, although my particular pharmacy and the local CVS were unfortunately not able to offer Minute Clinic services, I did look them up online to see what exactly they cover. I was very curious about this and wanted to look at perhaps the possibility of others in my area. Y'all know I love efficiency. I like the name Minute Clinic. That implies I'll be in and out. That's excellent branding right there. And I like this general concept that it's affordable. So a pharmacist can generally treat you for like these minor ailments. And also since they're limited to the 32 possible minor ailments, they can also reasonably predict that you'll be in and out of there pretty quickly because these are things that are easy to diagnose and prescribe treatments for. So if you are wanting to go and see a pharmacist, you may go if you have allergic rhinitis. So if you're having allergies, calluses and corns, contact dermatitis, so like you have touched something that your skin did not like, it decided you were allergic to it and produced an allergic response on your hands. You could also have a cough or a dandruff, menstrual cramps, indigestion, you can get emergency contraceptive through them. You can also get treatment for fungal infections of the skin, so think athlete's foot, things like that. If you have acid reflux or hemorrhoids or cold sores or a bunch of different types of rashes, acne, headaches, eczema, as long as it's not severe in nature. If you get stung by a bee or you get hives in reaction to being bitten or stung by something, so you have an allergic reaction to a bee sting or bite, if you are having muscle and joint pain or you're having trouble sleeping or you're nauseous a lot or you are generally congested nasally or you want to quit smoking or you have a sore throat, if you have diarrhea that's non-infectious or if you have oral thrush, if you have oral ulcers or worms, this has specifically threadworms and pinworms, uncomplicated UTIs, a yeast infection, warts that are anywhere but on the face and genitalia, they don't treat those there, or if you have dry eyes, they can really help you out in getting diagnosed, normally at a much cheaper rate and without you having to have insurance or without them having to be in your network and things like that. So if you have an HMO or something and you're supposed to be using one specific type of PCP or one specific primary care physician, period, then you can reach out to a pharmacist for one of these issues. Because if you're going to get charged for it even while you have insurance, you might as well get charged the cheaper way where they're also using those same diagnostic tests. However, that's not necessarily available as all 32 of the treatments or ailments rather that I listed, those aren't offered in all states. So in some states, it's limited to 12 different ones. So before you just show up to the Minute Clinic, it might be a good idea to call them and ask if they cover the specific issue that you're facing. If you are wanting to know which 12 of the ailments are usually still offered, that includes acne, eczema, diaper rash in newborns, cold sores, thrush, if you have recently used a corticosteroid inhaler, so for any respiratory issues, you can get thrush if you use a corticosteroid inhaler with that, so heads up as we are moving into respiratory illness territory with not just COVID-19, but also with the flu and the cold this fall coming up here in a little bit. We also have allergies that may pop up for the folks who have fall allergies, so that is another reason some folks end up using those respiratory inhalers that have corticosteroids in them, 
and when you do it can promote thrush in your throat so the growth of a yeast infection in your throat so make sure you're taking your probiotics or eating that probiotic rich yogurt that is low in sugars as we discussed in our yogurt episode and that can help you prevent getting sick with thrush from having to go on any kind of corticosteroids even if you do come down with the cold or flu or another illness this fall. The other types of minor ailments that are still treated by most pharmacists in the U.S. that have been at clinics, that is, also include conjunctivitis, so pink eye, allergic rhinitis, so allergies, mouth ulcers, and then painful menstruation, vaginal yeast infections, UTIs, and hemorrhoids. Over the years, they've also been able to add some tests for the flu and strep in there. So normally, things that required additional bacterial swabs and tests, things like that, would not have been something they could have treated when they first started entertaining this as an option years and years ago. But over the decades, with the advent of more innovation in modern medicine, we are now able to do these strep swabs really quickly and not have to send them off to a full lab and wait for a long time for the results to come back. You can get those strep results in minutes, and we can do that with the flu now too. I looked at different prices throughout the U.S. for different minute clinic type of facilities, so specifically these pharmacists that are able to provide what they are referring to as point-of-care testing. And in that way, you can almost think of it like a wholesale arrangement. And it's not that the drugs, or rather the treatments, are any cheaper necessarily just because you are going to see the pharmacist, but rather that it saves you money on seeing a physician if what you have may be simple enough to just be tested really quickly there on site. After all, pharmacists also have to go to school for a long time to learn about the different ins and outs of these medications. They are still studying medicine just from a different perspective, just a slightly different perspective. So they may also be able to provide you with a lot of point of care assistance that may also be cheaper just because you can go right there and get it and that also means it's more convenient. You also don't really have to have an appointment at most of these as they are considered to be walk-in clinics and you just go up and ask the pharmacy or the staff what your concern is. They also say that a lot of times it's someone whose child has been told that they're sick at school and then the parent has been asked to come and pick them up or the guardian and they take them to the pharmacy and ask them to give them a test for the strep or flu. So perhaps this is something that I didn't already know because I don't have biological children of my own, but just in case that's not the reason and uh, the rest of you were also in the dark about this and perhaps maybe this isn't and I was today years old thing for me, but regardless, the information is now out there. So if you already knew, awesome, pass that information around you would be surprised that there are still some of us out here who are unaware of these types of things. So what I'm also learning from this is that if I immediately feel like I don't feel well, instead of going to urgent care for some of these things like I have in the past and just taking a number and waiting or going to my PCP whenever they had the soonest availability, and my PCP is rad, so she is booked a lot, kind of like a really rad hairstylist. So in those situations, this could also be another really important or helpful issue for you. Or if you're traveling out of state and your insurance is wonky outside of that area, this may be relevant to many of us for many different reasons. But even if you're just coming home from work five miles from picking up your kid 
from school and you're like, you know, I'm pretty sure that I know what this is, but they're running a fever and I want to see if it's strep or the flu to see maybe if I can tell what I might be in for. And they go in and do that for you in the minute clinic and you can get results within minutes. It's kind of like the principle of Dollar General though. It's not necessarily one dollar or one minute, even though it is singular, but it you'll get it within minutes. It's pretty quick. And then you can go ahead and get the prescription while you're there. Of course, you know, it might take that 15 to 45 minutes or however long it takes at your local pharmacies, but they can get it done rather quickly. So if you need to stock up on soups and stuff for the munchkin not feeling well, or for yourself not feeling well, then you can go ahead and perhaps do that after you wash your hands while you wait for the results. They can often prescribe you even antibiotics or just allay your fears that there is nothing more serious going on that requires further medical attention. I haven't done this yet, but I'm really curious about it and I've decided to try that this week and see what it's like. And I will let you guys know more about that in a future episode if that is indeed the route I take this week. We're going to go on a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about this rapid strep test and what exactly you need to know if you are going in to get one. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. before in previous episodes at least at the surface level as we're talking about bacteria versus viruses and so on so now we're going to really talk about the specific strep test if you are anything like me you've had strep once or twice as a kid and or growing up and or recently like today So, in those cases, you generally know to recognize those little white pustules as being fairly typical of strep. But even so, most laws in the U.S. prevent us from just going up to the grocery store medicine aisle and just saying, Hey, I'm going to grab some antibiotics because I very clearly have strep as I have had it 600 times before, and just as I would be able to buy allergy medication for recognizing that I was having allergy issues, and be able to just, you know, grab that straight off of the shelf. We're not able to do that, and so folks are often forced to go to the doctor and pay for something that they may not even really typically usually need, at least in my opinion. Again, I'm not a doctor, but I've had strep enough to know it when I see it, at least in my own personal experience and my own symptoms that I get for strep throat. So what I'm saying is that because this is a requirement a lot of times in order to get the medication that you know you need, a cheaper way to get it might be going to get tested by a pharmacist at a pharmacy minute clinic that they have in some Walmarts or grocery stores or even CVSs. And you can get different tests that can cost less money oftentimes than they would otherwise out of pocket at 
another doctor's office if you went in for the same things without insurance. So, to find out if you have strep or to get the medication that you need to combat strep, you have to first get tested for it. And before now, you might have thought you could only go to a doctor. But you can also go to a pharmacist thanks to the advent of rapid strep tests instead of just that traditional culture that a lot of us grew up with. Strep is a bacterial infection of the throat and tonsils. It often presents with those pustules and you can spread it via respiratory droplets like via coughing or sneezing. And you can get strep at any age. It's most common in children, but you can get it at just about any age. Although if you're older than, I believe, 45 to 48 years old, they recommend reaching out to a doctor if you are getting strep because it is so much more common in younger individuals that it could be indicative of something else. So when you go to the doctor and, or the pharmacist in this case, you can get that rapid strep test that looks for antigens that are associated with strep A. And those antigens are what promote an immune response. A rapid strep test like this can give you results in under 20 minutes. They say it takes about 10 to 20 minutes to get the results back from this. So you'll just be chilling in the pharmacy area and or the clinic area if it's closed off. Again, I haven't experienced this before, so I'm not entirely sure what it would look like. I'll let you guys know if slash when I find out. But they say it takes about 10 to 20 minutes, and if the test is negative, but they still think that you might have strep, like you're presenting with the other symptoms, but you're getting a negative on the test, they might think it could be a false negative. So in that case, they would order a throat culture, or they might. That throat culture means they're just going to swab your throat and then smear that on an agar plate that has the necessary nutrients and stuff available to grow strep A. And they'll apply that swab from your mouth. And if there is strep A present, then they will see that pop up within 24 to 48 hours after they start the culture. So that takes a little bit longer to do a throat culture than it does to do that rapid strep test. If you are a lot younger than I am, then this may be the first time that you have heard of it taking 24 to 48 hours to get results for a test like this. I may sound like I'm just talking about floppy disks or something, or Walkman, but you get where I'm coming from. It used to take us a really long time, and I am really jazzed that not only... They have these rapid strep tests now, but that also we can get them from pharmacists and remove some of those barriers to medical access, or at least lower them by a few bricks. Now, some people may wonder, you know, hey, this is a sore throat. Why do I need the strep A test? Why do I have to get these antibiotics anyway? But that is generally because antibiotics are necessary to handle bacterial infections antibiotics don't work on viral infections remember so if it is a virus we are not going to use antibiotics for that but we do if it is for bacteria and we've discussed that in our previous episodes on antibiotics now the importance of this isn't just that you get rid of the sore throat but that if you continue to have untreated strep then you can also be spreading that to other people you could also get further complications as well. And that is not a lot of fun, and it can actually lead to some really serious issues, like that bacteria getting into your bloodstream and causing bacteremia, or even worse. So we want to make sure that we rule this out, and if it's coming back as strep, that we are getting it treated with those antibiotics so it does not snowball. So if you feel that you are going to have to go in for this, what can you reasonably expect for a strep A test? Whether that's performed at a pharmacy or your doctor's doing it, well, they do the rapid test and the throat culture the same way in regards to your component of it. So they'll ask you to tilt your head back and open up your mouth and maybe say, ah, 
or hold a tongue depressor on your tongue to keep your tongue down themselves and then they will swab the back of your throat and your tonsil area trying to get some of those white materials and such and then they will do the rapid strep test right there or they will perhaps send it off to a lab if they are not able to offer a rapid strep test. Again, make sure you call in and ask first too if you're trying to decide between different locations. You may also have a second sample of it taken just in case the first one comes back is inconclusive so that they can grow the, th the throat culture if they need to without you having to come back into the office. You don't need to prepare anything special with this though. It's better for you if you drink water and stuff like that during this time. Things that don't have a lot of sugar so that you don't help that bacteria grow. But other than that, you don't need to really be doing anything special for this. You, d you can go ahead and eat right before if you feel up to eating. And there aren't really any risks to getting these swab tests, but they might be a little bit uncomfortable. It's not as wild looking as the COVID-19 tests. So it's not going way up your nose and everything. It's just going in your throat where you can see those spots in the mirror when you put a flashlight in there. That's as far as they're going. So if they end up saying that you do have strep throat, a lot of these pharmacies are able to go ahead and get you an antibiotic prescription for that. It just depends on where you live in the U.S. But I highly encourage you to take a look at the different pharmacies in your area and your local laws and see if perhaps you have this option available to you too. Well, that's really all I have for you guys today as my voice is also starting to fade back out following that cough drop and I'm getting that gravel back from earlier in today's episode. But thank you for listening to the GSMC Health and Wellness Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to the show, and also, getting a nice review always really helps us. Also, if you could please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, I'd appreciate it. Thank you kindly, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Health and Wellness Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.